Hi everyone, welcome to Bassendine Library's Literary Salon for July and our guest is Norman Jorgensen who is a very prolific <laughs> writer who predominantly writes for young people and is also an award winner. So I think we've got lots of, lots of things that he can share with us and lots of little stories to tell and I've done my research and we're going to get some good anecdotes out of tonight. So, <laughs> And at the end, please, you're very welcome to ask any questions and books are for sale um, for $15 each and Norman is very happy to sign them. So thank you and thank you Norman, welcome to us. It's great. Bassendine is my favourite library. <laughs> no, it seriously is. I've been coming here for years to talk to kids for Book Week, and, and I'm always treated very well and made like I'm one of the family. So thank you, Patricia. <laughs> so tell me about the young Norman. Was he a writer? Yes, absolutely. I, I discovered um, Secret Seven by Ina Blyton when I was about seven, eight years, seven years old. And I loved them. I loved them with a passion because they weren't boring like Dick and Dora ran up at the hill. They were, they were funny and these kids had real adventures. And I wanted to be a Secret Seven more than anything in the world. And I used to pester my mum and I said, I've got to get the uniform. It was a long English raincoat, cub cap, thick woolen scarf and rubber sole shoes and a little badge with SS on it. <laughs> and anyhow, I, I pestered my mum for weeks, months. And finally Christmas came round and she got me an English raincoat. She must have got it from... Gabardine. Must have got it from the op shop, I think. Anyway, so I put my Gabardine raincoat on and my cup cap and I wandered all over Narragin, where we lived, trying to find some smugglers and, and burglars and... <laughs> in an Australian summer. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. it was 40 degrees in the shade in Narragin. There I was sweating like... And after a few weeks, and people were laughing at me, understandably, after a few weeks I decided I didn't want to be a Secret Seven anymore. Maybe I could write about Secret Seven. So I got... I got Well Done Secret 7, the, the book. I sat down and I rewrote it. And I added an extra memory in called Norman, the clever one. <laughs> and I called it Adventures of the Secret 8. <laughs> and, and Norman, um, every time he caught a burglar or a robber, the police gave him a huge reward. And he ended up as the richest kid in the world at the end of the book. <laughs> and my brothers liked it. I had three little brothers. They liked it. I took it to school, showed some of my friends, and they liked it. And in, and in fact... I was, we were at the back of a class one time and I sh my friend's reading it and he starts laughing and the teacher came along and she got really angry because she was supposed to be doing maths and, and so she confiscated it. And, and, um, but a, f a few weeks later, towards the end of term, I, I, she started reading to the class every afternoon, um, just a couple of pages, and I suddenly became really popular because everyone wanted to know what happened next. Mm. And I ended it on like Ina does on a cliffhanger at the end of every chapter. And yeah, even girls started talking to me for the first time in my life, <laughs> Sim simply by being a writer. And I've been doing it ever since to impress girls. <laughs> and how, how, how old were you when you wrote that? I was about eight. And I kept on writing through primary school. And, and, and I liked writing, but it took me forever to get published. When, when, it, uh, when I left school, I went to work in a bookshop called The Singing Tree. It was a children's specialist bookshop. That's right. I and... I love working there. It was yeah. fantastic. And I started to see the very best of all the children's books in the world, but also the very worst because <laughs> yeah. everything came through. And I said to one of my work colleagues, oh, this is rubbish. I, I could have written this. He said, I bet you couldn't have. So I sat down that, that night and wrote Ash of the Outback, this one here. Oh. And, and I did it in comic style like, like so. Uh, like I didn't do the illustrations. I just did the words. But um, like Tintin or Asterix. And part of the reason is boys weren't reading. They'd stop reading. Yep. And, um, but they were reading Tintin books. I knew Tintin in India came out and they printed six million copies for the first print run. And so I tried to emulate uh, Tintin, Hergé. And it was pretty popular because uh, it was 30-odd years ago and there was hardly anyone in West Australia getting published. Um, there was me and Elaine Forrestal and, and hardly anyone else. And, and it sold thousands of copies. So that was your first book that was published? Mm. Yeah. Okay. And how old were you when that was published? 30. Okay. Yeah. All right. 35. And so, I can't remember. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> 30 something. <laughs> so, yeah, so from when leaving school to getting my first book published, it, it was a long, long time. Still a while. And so when you, so you started writing as a young person, were mm. you encouraged through, like by teachers and through doing English and stuff like that? Or did they yeah. not really pay much attention? No, they, you, the teachers did. Um, yeah. I would, I found out really young, uh, at a young age, that I wasn't any good at sport. 
Okay. Well, I couldn't catch anything and I can't run. And if yeah. you can't run very fast and can't catch anything, it cuts out nearly 90% of all sport. But it didn't yeah. bother me because I love reading. I discovered yeah. reading. I discovered Neil Blyton and all the other English authors around at the time. And, and um, so I wasn't the least bit concerned about not being picked for the school teams. Yeah. I could sit under a tree and read. Bliss. And I've done that sort of thing ever since. And what did your parents think of you writing and focusing on reading and writing? Um, they were both big. Well, my dad especially was a big reader. Okay. Um, he belonged to the Reader's Book Club. And every every couple of weeks he got a, a condensed uh, novel arrived. Um, and he, he did encourage... Um, he worked for the government, so he got paid every two weeks, on a Thursday every two weeks, and he'd bring me back home an Indian Blyton book, even though they cost three and six or four shillings, which was a lot of money. Yeah. So he obviously did um, value reading, and then was pleased that I, pleased that I was into it as well. And so, as an adult, what's your preferred genre to read? I read historical fiction. Okay. Um, my favourite is an author called C.J. Sansom, who wrote Dissolution, and it's about King Henry VIII closing down the monasteries, and um, a lawyer involved in that. And his name's Matthew Shardlake. And after about half an hour of reading Sense, and you need to go and have a shower. <laughs> you just feel so grubby because he, he gets medieval London perfectly. And, and you're breathing the spells and the, the horse poo is everywhere and, and the dust and the grime and, and, and the menace of the times and, and uh, the, the pestilence that was everywhere. Mm. Um, yeah, so he's written a whole load of books and I, I like him very much. He's very, like, very much like Hilary Mantel mm-hmm. who wrote whatever, bring up the bodies. But um, I think he does a better job than she does. And have you ever been tempted to write in that style? Oh. Uh, I did do a historical book for a teenager set in Coolgardie mm-hmm. uh, at the turn of the century. And I spent a time at Coolgardie just soaking up the grime and the atmosphere and the dust of, and the, of the outback of Coolgardie and trying to feel the same way my characters did. Mm. In fact, I always do that. With anything I'm writing, I always go to the places I'm writing about. I, okay. I think that's essential. You, you, I did one called Jack's Island, which is set on Rottnest. I went and lived on Rottnest for two months. One day, I went down to the beach to write a scene there. And, and I, I said, what, one of the rules is use all your senses. And I thought, what can I actually smell? I could smell the, the salt and I could smell the, the seaweed. Because the seaweed on the beach is all rotting. I could feel the sun on the back of my neck and the sweat running down my back. I could feel the salt, the sand between my toes. I could hear the waves crashing. I could hear a motorboat start up. I could smell the bakery. And <laughs> you put all these little details into your story and then your reader feels like they're there with you, makes it more authentic. Yep. Sometimes you have to uh, trim it back because you overdo it and you detract from the, from the plot. Yep. Uh, too much scenery and not enough action. But, but that's second second draft and third draft and fourth draft. And, yeah. But I think you need... To, yeah, so I've made a point of going everywhere I've written about and sitting under a palm tree, soaking it up. Did you go there? Yes. <laughs> okay. So this book here is one of Norman's earliest ones. That's correct, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, one of your earliest ones called mm. In Flanders Fields and it's for, for young children describing World War One. sorry, just in case anyone doesn't know about it. And it's it's really quite um, moving. That must have been pretty full on to go there and to try and, I guess, absorb the period of time and what had happened. Like, was that was that difficult? Yeah, we went to Flanders in midwinter. Um, cause Jen, my wife, is a school teacher. So yeah. we could only go in school holidays. <laughs> Thank goodness she isn't anymore. <laughs> we can go any time until, until this, this year. <laughs> um, and we went to, to Flanders. And I'd written, st- I'd done a, f- a draft of the story. Yeah. And it wasn't working. I didn't have any heart. And I went to visit my old gran who lived in old folks home. Um, and I was telling her about it. And, and, and she said, why don't you go there? You, you say that's the best thing to do. And I said, oh, I, can't, I can't go to fr- Flanders. It's in Belgium. Gran, it cost a fortune. He said, I'll pay for it if you like. Oh, that's nice of you, Gran. Will five hundred dollars be enough? <laughs> she, more than enough, Gran. <laughs> and she said, "Before you go, can you see if you can find Uncle Jim's grave?" Uncle Jim was a sixteen-year-old uncle, and he ran away to the war. And um, the first thing his mother knew about it, she got a telegram eighteen months later, saying he, um, yeah, he died. 
and no one had ever been to visit his grave. And so I got onto the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and they have a great site and it tells you exactly where everyone yeah. is buried. Okay. Um, and in this particular instance said, you go to Wipers, drive out of town, you'll come to this village, um, drive to the edge of the village, there's a church, turn left at the church, you'll go drive along, you'll find three oak trees, turn right there and you'll find Menden Road South Cemetery three and he's in B71. Okay. So we drive along, we're looking for this village, and Orkin finds this massive great industrial town. Oh. <laughs> but there was an old lady um, sitting on a bench, uh, uh, and I said, was there a church here? I said, yes, where McDonald's is. <laughs> so, so we drove, turned left at McDonald's, and there was three massive oak trees, because they'd been there 100 years, and there was a graveyard, and we found it. So I, I took the photograph of Uncle Jim's grave, and when we came back to Australia, I went to see my grand and said, here you go, grand. And she didn't quite believe it. But, um, wow. And I'm so glad she did that I got it because she died about a week later. And I mean, oh. yeah, if we'd stayed on in France like we wanted to, um, you know, I would have felt really, really bad. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's moving. It's so moving. It's bleak and miserable. And every time you go over a hill, there's a graveyard and white crosses or white tombstones as far as the eye can see. And you drive over another hill and there's another one. And drive it, another, another hill. It, it's... Uh, completely sobering but you're also in the greenest lovely countryside uh, it, it's hard to reconcile the, that such terrible events went on so what made you want to decide to tell that story for young people it came about um because i was watching a movie no a documentary about the early days of filmmaking and there's a film called all quiet in the western front yep. based on eric mark's books it was one of the last silent movies ever made it was made in 1928 okay one of the first silent films they did two versions because a lot of cinemas didn't have sound equipment and the final scene in all quiet in the western front is the young soldier paul who's been taken from school and at school he used to collect butterflies and he reaches out uh, to above his sandbag because the butterfly lands and as he reaches for it um he grabs hold of it and he gets shot by a french sniper and he dies, and as he dies, his hand turns over and the butterfly flies away, as if it's his soul leaving his body. And then the screen just goes black. And it, wow, <laughs> it was hard enough watching the film, let alone an, an ending like that. Then about 10 seconds later, these ghostly images of all the soldiers appear and they're marching off. They turn back to stare at you accusingly. And oh. yeah, powerful, powerful film. I think I saw it at school and I, I, I was driving home from work one day and the song came on the radio. The band played Walsy Medilda, the Eric Bogle song. And um, I just pulled over the side of the road, got a notebook, which I've had ever since, and, and just wrote the outline of the story. And that's the one I took to Grant and said, you know, this is what I'm working on. So you didn't necessarily intend to write a story, it just kind of came to you yeah, to turn it absolutely. into a story? Mm. And, it was and that happens all the time. You'd, I don't intend to write anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard. The story is 70,000 words. <laughs> and you can sit there in a darkened room by yourself months at a time <laughs> with imaginary friends <laughs> and enemies. <laughs> Did you get feedback from young people about it? Um, this one? Yeah. It's been really popular. It, yeah. uh, one teacher read it to classic seven-year-olds and I was quite horrified. Uh, but they don't see, they don't, they don't see the, the the horror. They just see the bird and right. the, the, the being rescued and the, the okay. lovely side of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, so you've you've built your career on books for young people. Mm. Um, does it require? How can I say this tactfully? We talked about this before. Does it require a certain kind of headspace <laughs> 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 to to speak to that demographic? Tell us your story, Norman. How do you approach it? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was trying to not say. What I, I, I describe myself once as a, the, the mind of a 12 year old in an ageing body, <laughs> an ageing writer's body. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a bit of arrested development going on. And I, 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 and I think Jane gets a bit fed up being married to a 12 year old. <laughs> She's right a, real, a real man. <laughs> But on the other hand, um, I see life slightly differently to a lot yep. of people. I, do. I look for, I don't look for the seriousness or the yep. worst that can happen. I always look for yep. the best that happened. Yep. I, th I think I'm a 12 year old optimist and kids tend to pick up on that. Yep. And also I, when I'm writing, I'm working on a pact between me and the 12 year old kid that's reading it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't include any adults whatsoever. 
Yeah. Um, her role doll. So it's between him and the, the child. Right. And, and that's why he pushes the boundaries. Yep. Because the kids find it funny. They'll go there. They'll go there. Yeah. yeah. And I, I try and push the boundaries. Yeah. So you're writing your Inner Blight and Adventures as Norman Jorgensen, you know, in the the Viking story and the. Yeah, it's, it's as if I'm the, the main character. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing about myself every single time. Yeah. <laughs> as, that, as that 12-year-old in that raincoat <laughs> yeah. having those adventures. It is, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, speaking of Roald Dahl, was that uh, something that you discussed with him when you got to meet him? <laughs> How did you get to meet to meet Roald Dahl in a little Perth? Good name dropping, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, just before we do, the last I did one of these sessions w- uh, with Marcus Zusak, who you know, wrote um, Lo- Book Thief, yeah. yeah. And it was a room full of 350 teacher librarians. And the your person, Gabby, Gabby's interviewer. equivalent, the interviewer, <laughs> um, wrote to me and said, can you send me 10 questions I can ask you so that um, you'll know what you're talking about. You won't be no surprises. And she did the same for Marcus. Then she sat down there between the two of us and asked me all Marcus's questions. <laughs> and, What's it like being a bestseller on the New York Times list? <laughs> <laughs> don't know yet. <laughs> I don't, yeah. <laughs> That's what I should have said. <laughs> That's all good. Yeah, um, yes, but then she continued down. on. Yep. Uh, sorry. No, mm. go ahead. No, then she continued. Once she realised she she made a mistake, she didn't change over. She just kept going with Marcus's questions. But then we, I think we both bluffed our way through. I was going to say, did he do you justice? Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't send me any millions either, though. <laughs> Damn it. So, um, Roald Dahl, <laughs> oh, tell us the story. Yeah. Um, I worked at the Singing Tree Bookshop, as I said, and Roald Dahl is 79, the year before he died, touring Australia. And he had, Penguin didn't fly him around Australia in his own jet, even though he'd made billions for them. He, he just was going from town to town. And one Saturday morning, he came into the shop and, and um, he was just looking around and I recognised him and and went up to say hello, but uh, the small boy got there first, and so he sat down on the uh, you know, the, the library stools, that looked like little tardises. He sat on one of those and chatted to this boy for about half an hour. The kid had been looking through the dull, the D for dull section. Did he know who it was? Yeah, I recognised oh, him. Yeah, no, yeah. did the boy? The boy, oh, the boy, was there with the D's A B C D. Yeah, and he looks. Oh, Oh, okay. So he, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and he was really nice to him. Then he came up to the counter and said, would I mind ordering my taxi? Because he had to go to the Regal Cinema. Kids had won a competition to see him talk. I said, no, no. Um, <laughs> and I did a black books thing. Um, Shop shut, everyone get out. <laughs> and I, I, drove, I drove him into the Regal. <laughs> and he walked onto stage, he had his walking stick, and the kids started getting demented. The Regal's full of, you know, how big it is. They were banging on the floor, cheering and screaming. Went on for 20 minutes, half an hour. Wow. And eventually he just sat on the chair and waited for them to stop. And then he got up and he talked for about 20 minutes and then it started again as he left. And so I took him then to his hotel, the Sheraton, down in, um, down in Milligan Street. And, and he said, would you like a cup of tea? So I went and had a cup of tea and we discussed wow. my, my, my wannabe writing career and his. <laughs> and his uh, and he was lovely, really nice. And a lot of people said he was really grumpy and mean because he'd crashed his Spitfire in World War II and had back pain all his life. Oh, That's why okay. he used to write in an armchair with a board across because okay. it's the only place he could get comfortable. But there was not a hint of it. He was really nice to the, the, the little boy. Mm. He was really nice to me. Mm. And um, mm. he gave me someone to talk about from <laughs> then mm. onwards. That really impresses children. Mm. Did he give you any sage advice? Uh, that, that one about it's the uh, it's a pact between me and the okay. kids. Okay. Yeah. So you did just disc- there was a discussion. Yeah. I love that. Mm. That's 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 a gorgeous one to take yeah. away, isn't it? And he, he died um, about a year later. Um, so he's eighty when he died. Yeah. And he, he had a great life. Mm. Uh, knew Ian Fleming and, and C.S. Forrester and uh, had all the kids in the world thinking he's the greatest writer who ever lived. Oh, that <laughs> imagination! <laughs> just incredible. So, um, what do you like about being? A writer, like tell us a little bit about yeah, your I, life as an author. I, I love the the first part where you, you you've got the hint of an idea and you start exploring it and mm-hmm. you invent, invent a character to, to go on the journey and and I said invent myself. I'd go on the journey. Twelve <laughs> year old Norman. <laughs> yes, yep. absolutely. And it, and I write about what how I'd feel if, if I was in these terrible situations. Yep. And then, for instance, I've written the the Smuggler's Curse, which is about Red Reed a boy who's sold by his mother as, as a cabin boy to a sea captain, and he gets involved in all sorts of adventures in Southeast Asia. Um, cannibals come after him, headhunters and pirates, and 
and I just write about what would be like if I was read in this situation. And so there's a lot of sweating going on and terror and throwing up in fright and cannons going off and bomb, bombs crashing around. And mm. yeah. So that's me, and I love that part of it, mm. deciding what I'm going to do with him next, where we're going to go, what exciting place, location. I say to Jan, would you, would you like, to, like to go to Langkawi? I'd like to set a story on <laughs> Langkawi. <laughs> And she said, why don't you set one in Venice? (laughs) And so when you have an idea, do you just write it or do you speak to your publisher or how do you kind of negotiate that process? No, it's a hit and miss. Um, (laughs) You, just like someone starting out, uh, Mm. you you write the story and you hand it in and the publisher, I'd normally get sent to a reader in Free Metal Press, they get sent Mm -hmm. to a reader and if they like it, then it gets into the publishing team and two or three of them will read it then. Right. Then they have a a publishing meeting and the person who likes it the most will go in and fight for it. Oh, okay. Because they get 600 manuscripts a year at Free Metal Press and they do about 20. So you've got a one in 30 chance of being published. Once you've had one published um, they, and it's been successful, then you've got a, a few rungs up the ladder. I was going to ask yeah. because, you know, you, you've, got, mm. you've got a bit of a, a back catalogue mm. that, um, you There's know, reinforces there. your capacity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you've won so many awards. Um, are there any you care to, I any you care to show and tell? <laughs> tell us what you brought and why um, and what's special about it. Yeah. You get the little gold circle on your book and... It's, uh, it's Children's Book Council's Book of the Year, which they re- launch, re- release every book week. And it's the most prestigious award to win in, in West Australia. There's loads of other awards, but this is the one we all aim at. And you get a ton of money, enough to go overseas, but you also get one of these. And I show this to all the school kids I talk to. Um, not to show off, even though I'm showing off like mad, um, is to <laughs> let them know that they can actually win an Olympic medal <laughs> by, by using the imagination. Or, and Brian Harrison yep. Lever, who did the illustrations, got his for his artwork. He got his for drawing. And I got mine for making up imaginary people. And um, it's, it's not just swimming up and down a black line or running 100 metres in 9.4 seconds. You can actually get one yep. and get all the kudos that comes with it. Yep. Yeah, love it. Um, the, other, the other awards mm-hmm. that are worth getting uh, in is the West Australian... Thank you. <laughs> yes. Your agent down the back. <laughs> yeah, West Australian Young Readers Book Award, which is the Kids' Choice Award. Um, there's a list of, um, of about 20 odd books um, in various categories, and the kids vote for them in their schools. And then uh, you win that award, and I've won that four times, which is fantastic. Um, and it means the kids you're writing for, the ones that yep. actually like your books, yep. it's not middle-aged librarian saying, oh, this is worthy. <laughs> I love middle-aged librarians. <laughs> um, it, it's the kids are actually reading it, giving it an excellent uh, yep. vote. And, yep. yeah, so I, I so d- you do lots of school talks. So I, what's yeah. that like, talking directly to your audience? It's harrowing. <laughs> really? We're just talking to Neil, a kid who wrote an Anzac book. And, and, and um, he, he, he was saying, yeah, at, at the end of it, you feel like, You've been run over, don't you? Because um, <laughs> you're, you're performing, but you're also on track, yeah. and, and um, you've got all these kids and they're going to ask you questions from any, everywhere. Yeah. They ask a question, you answer that, and you where am I up to now? Um, in, okay. Um, you know, often we we show PowerPoints, um, and it keeps you on track, because you flick the, you flick the c- slide to the next yep. one. Oh, now I know what I'm talking okay. about. Okay. Otherwise, um, it happened one time at, at Christchurch Grammar, and I was talking to the grade four boys, and we're getting on really well. And it was in their chapel. Uh, they've got a fantastic looking chapel with glass looks at it down over the Swan River. Mm-hmm. And, I was nice. ta- and I was talking about the Catalinas that used to land there in World okay. War II. The boys are really into it. And then the PowerPoint died. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. White screen. And, and normally I'd say, oh, sorry kids, and bluff them away and tell jokes and keep on going. I just left blank. I could, what? Am I, what? Um, uh, <laughs> and they're not forgiving um, Ten-year-old boys at all. <laughs> so that was my worst experience. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> you could have just told them a story or made up a story. Uh, normally, or normally I would have. You just, <laughs> you just kind of had that freeze moment. I just had yeah. the freeze moment, yeah. Okay. Like, you know, I do 100 or so a year and, and most of them are fine, but yeah, that, that one was a bit memorable. And what about young girls? Do they like your stories too? Because there seems to yeah. be, apparently. I, yeah. um, do they not say anything in the... No, no. Um, 
um, surprisingly, I meant not apparently, surprisingly, uh, um, the smuggler's curse is a 12-year-old boy, the one who got sold by his mother. Um, and a lot of girls seem to like him. Okay. I, yeah, there's, he, I get, let us say, he needs to have more romance, of oh, course. Oh, okay. <laughs> when okay. I, was, I, I was 12, there was no romance whatsoever, so that's what I'm writing about. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So what else have you got here? What, what, what else have you got here? What's this black notebook that we have oh. down here? Jack's Island. Okay. And that um, was based on my father. When he was a boy, um, he went to live on Rottnest uh, in World War II. And the reason why is um, the government was worried about the Japanese invading Perth. And they thought they would turn Rottnest in the first line of defence. So they moved all the holiday makers up, off. They moved over 3,000 soldiers. They put barbed wire on all the beaches and landmines and built those big naval guns up on the hills. They put an army barracks. But to do all this, they needed workers, and my granddad got sent over there. He had been working on the roads. And so he took his family with him, and so my dad went to school. It was a one-teacher school with 30 kids, and the sons and daughters of all the workers there. Yep. And, and my dad used to tell us what a great life it was. We'd been a kid living on Rottnest, and the teacher was quite elderly, so he, he didn't turn up half the time, so the kids just went off. And <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, because all, all the young teachers had joined the army. Yeah. Oh, of course. And so he would go swimming every day and, and build canoes and build go-karts. And One time he came to Kalgoorlie with me and he started talking. And I knew a lot of his stories, but this time he did it in order. And we had six hours to kill. So he, of course. Yeah. Yep. And so after about half an hour, I pressed the record on my tape recorder. Didn't Smart. even tell him. Yep. Uh, and after six hours, I had enough there. And I went and saw Kate, my editor, and said, what do you reckon? And then she said, yes, it's great. Um, you need more of a plot. You can't just have two, <laughs> two, two kids having a lot of fun. And so uh, the plot we used was uh, another boy on the island called Dafty, who was simple. He was too simple to go to school, but he really wanted to be a, a, a school kid. So every afternoon at 3 o'clock, he would come to the school ground when the kids came out and bring him presents and play with them. Mm-hmm. And poor little Dafty fell in love with a girl called Bess, who was in year 10. And she wouldn't have anything to do with him. And he kept trying to impress her. And one day he he stole a truck and, and to show that he was big enough to drive and he crashed it. Mm. Uh, anyhow, the police sergeant decided that poor little Dafty was no longer just a harmless boy. He, he'd have to be taken to the uh, care. So he, he put him on the ferry to take him to the lunatic asylum at Fremantle. And all the kids were really upset because they liked Dafty. They, they, he, he, his mascot... And Dafty jumped overboard and tried swimming back to shore and disappeared. And the teacher had to come into the class the next morning and said, kids, I've got some really bad news. Timothy is small, the boy you all called Dafty, has drowned. And life suddenly went from a lot of fun to quite sad for quite some weeks. And then weeks later, someone saw a campfire way out on the far end of the island. And the army thought it was the start of the invasion. Maybe it was a Japanese raiding party. And they went rushing out there, and there's nothing there, just a campfire. And it happened two or three more times, and odd things started happening. And what has happened is little Dafty hadn't drowned after all. He'd got back to the island, and he's not as simple as everyone thinks. He's looking after himself. He'd been sneaking into the settlement at night time and stealing food and been living on quokkas and snakes. And, and Jack and his brother discovered him. Mm-hmm. And they had to decide, do they tell the parents mm-hmm. or keep it secret? And they mm-hmm. decided to keep it secret, mm-hmm. and they start pinching stuff for him as well. Until eventually the police sergeant comes along and said, Jack, it's little Dafty, isn't it? And Jack won't say anything. Mm. He's not going to give his friend up. Mm. And the police sergeant says, you realise, of course, winter's coming. There's a small boy all by himself living on the island. He'll die of exposure. And if you don't tell me, Jack, you'll be responsible for his death. Mm. <laughs> Nothing by like a bit of pressure. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, um, guess how you find out what happened to him. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Available afterwards. <laughs> and, um, but that's been massively popular with teachers. They've been um, setting up class sets in grade four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Awesome. Yeah, and, awesome. And so I have to often go to schools and justify myself. Um, <laughs> why are the <laughs> curtains blue? Uh, does it signify the depressed times? <laughs> okay. No, they're blue because my auntie used to have blue curtains in her house. <laughs> it's really quite simple. Did your dad read the story? He loved it. Absolutely. And when it won the Young Readers Book Award, I was overseas, and um, he went and accepted the award. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
How long did he live on Rottnest as a young boy? About three years, I think. That's 19, a long time. 1938, 1940, up to 42, um, so four years, when the Japanese um, bombed Pearl Harbor. Okay. They moved all the civilians off because suddenly the threat was a lot more real. So he was there four years. And, and, and that's, a, that's an amazing and um, A lot of kids experience. like the story, um, yeah. even though they have to study it, um, because the heroes in it have got such freedom. Yep. They, they do whatever they like. You know, they, they go out at 7 in the morning, come home at 7 yep. at night if they're hungry or not. Yeah. And, um, and none of the kids, modern kids, have got any freedom whatsoever. No. Their, their mums pick them up from school and they go sent to violin lessons and they're watched the whole time yep. and cotton wool covered. And, whereas the, yeah, you can identify with these two characters. They're the same age as you are, and, but they're having the best life. And it's Rottnest, you yeah, know. It's, yeah. it's, our, mm. it's in our sort of city so to speak it's as opposed to happening in England or yeah. you know somewhere else so I think that there's always an appeal because I know that I've always enjoyed reading books that are, are set here because it you know it, you can re- reflect it's reflected back where we live is reflected back and you know we don't really get it as much as you know especially not in kids books which I reckon is, is I, really cool. I, when I wrote The Smuggler's Curse I'd had a rule all my books will be set in Western Australia or about Australians either mm. one. Um, and I decided I'd been in England on holiday and uh, picked up the idea for the smuggler's curse story. Um, I, I stayed at um, a lighthouse on the Shetland Islands. Okay. My, I went with my old mate, Alan. It was, it was midwinter and Jan wouldn't come with me. <laughs> Can't understand that. <laughs> no, <laughs> she, she was off on a school trip, I think. And he has, Alan, my best mate, and I went and stayed at this lighthouse out in the Shetland Islands, which are cool. north of S- Scotland, 12-hour ferry ride north of Aberdeen. And we, we got there, and um, the lighthouse keeper uh, showed us the, the two two rooms, you know, the, like the cottage. And he said, which room do you want? And, and Alan and I flipped a coin, um, and I lost. I got the small room, but it was, wasn't was small. It was the size of this, and had a big, huge stone fireplace. And so I built up the fire and sat down on the armchair, and he came in, to, the keeper came in to make sure I was happy. And they said, do you like your room? And I said, oh, I love it. It's got this such a great atmosphere. There's something about it. The walls are this thick. It's warm and cosy. And the wind's blowing outside. And he said, you realise... He didn't know what I did for a living. He said, you realise this is where Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Treasure Island? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah. He and his stepson, Lloyd Osborne, sat where you are and nutted, nutted out the very first draft of Treasure Island. Because the lighthouse had been built by Robert's father. He was a famous oh. lighthouse builder. And he used to go and stay with him. And... You know, I, I, I would have travelled halfway across the world to find this room, and I actually fluked it. I even fluked yeah. losing the coin. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. And so that night, I sat down with this, and I tried writing a pirate story. Oh, it's good enough for Robert. It's good enough for me. I'm writing my man. And there's a knock on the door, and Alan says, "Do you want some breakfast?" I said, what are you talking about? It's nine o'clock. He, yeah. Next morning, I stayed up all night. Oh. Because it was dark, I couldn't tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so I wrote this English smuggler's curse story. And I brought it back and showed it to Kate, my editor, and she goes, yes, it's really good, it's exciting, it's adventurous. You wouldn't consider moving it to Australia, would you? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> yeah, come on, move it to Australia. All you've got to do is change the weather. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and the, the location. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually much worse than that. But I then she said, why not Broome? And the turn of the well, 1880s, Broome was a wild place, one of the wildest places on earth, like Dodge City. And everyone who was escaping through the law or their families went to Broome and they could make fortunes um, in the pearling industry. And so I tried it and the more I researched Broome, mm-hmm. um, the more I, I got to, to like the idea and I switched okay. it over. Okay. Yeah, so I not only had to switch the, the, the location and the weather and the time because um, Broome wasn't even originally, the first one was set in 1810. And Broome wasn't even formed as a city until 1880. Okay. So I had to move it up. And the trouble is, by this time, sailing ships are starting to fade away and they're being replaced by steamships. And I didn't like the idea of steamships, so um, I had to some fine juggling to get it right. Bit of uh, creative licence. Yes, yeah, just, yeah, just cool. a touch. But you can't get too creative because there's all these pedantic people that pick up on every single... <laughs> it's a story! <laughs> <laughs> it's fiction! Yeah, absolutely. That'd be boring. <laughs> um, is there anything else... Uh, among this, I'm just mindful that the time has zipped past. Oh, right. Yes, yeah. um, I've just finished the third one in the sequel, uh, the series ah. of the Smuggler's Curse, the Wrecker's Revenge, which um, is a 
based on Coral Island, they, they get shipwrecked out in Cocos Island, and um, and how you got to def- so you went to Cocos one. Island. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I, I went to Cocos and um, I was having a writing workshop with this little group group of writers. There's five little boys. Again, about ten. Yep. Yeah. Tough crowd, those 10-year-olds for you, aren't they? Yeah. So they, <laughs> they were telling me about William Dampier, who came to their, their their island on his way back from Australia after he did sailed up all the coast of West Australia and landed at Broome, where Broome was going to be, and then sailed to Cocos and then on to Christmas Island, then Reunion and then home. When he got back to England, he didn't have the chest of gold that he was supposed to have had. He'd been a pirate, so he had a chest full of gold. Yeah. It disappeared somewhere along the way. And no. everyone reckons he probably left it at Reunion because that was the last place he called. Mm-hmm. Whereas I reckon it would be the first place he called because the journey is going to be hazardous. So uh, I said to the kids, I reckon it's here somewhere. And where's, oh. where's the best place to bury gold? Somewhere you can find it again. There's a graveyard. And we went out to the graveyard and, and I measured 100 paces from the point, that, from the east, the north and the south, and there's this really, really old grave. It's got a wooden marker and you can't hardly read it. I was telling the boys, I said, if you're going to bury the God, it'd have to be here, wouldn't it? You've got a marker to come back to. Didn't think anything more about it. Next morning, I get a call from the principal, and she said, the principal wants to see you straight away. I got in, why have you been telling the children? I said, nothing, why? And she said, we were just discussing William Dampier. One of their mums stopped to the two youngest ones digging up a grave. <laughs> not, at, and not even the same one. They measured 100 paces. Their paces is much smaller than mine. <laughs> Some granny who died only two years ago. They were about this deep before the mum saw them and stopped them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it got reported in the in the Cocos Island Gazette. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And I didn't get invited back for book week next year. <laughs> <laughs> but that'd be enough to plant the seed to create like an urban legend. It's, that there's treasure here, but it's all Norman's fiction. And I love it. It gave me the seed for the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. So um, <laughs> Wrecker's Revenge starts off on Cocos That's Island. That's too mm. funny. So you're working on your third book in yeah, that series now? Yeah, um, just finished it. Last Friday it. I handed okay. it in. Oh, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, 70,360 words. Uh, <laughs> and Kate, my editor, will get hold of it and cut it down to 65. <laughs> without <Yep>. their <laughs> And why is he wearing a red shirt on page one and page three? He hasn't been home, but his shirt's blue. Yeah, that's oh, all that sort of okay. stuff. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. And was it a relief to hand that over? I've been, yeah, it, well, I started a year ago and we went to, Lang, no, to Koh Samui and um, I'm off school holiday time, there's oh. no children around. Yeah. yeah. And sat, uh, so I sat by the pool with the notebook and wrote like fury. And, and is that how it happens for you? Once you've no. got an idea, you just keep go going and go keep going right, and yeah. there's no writer's block or... No, I, I often... Say writer's blocks for amateurs. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I know, it's, it's, it sounds much more pretentious than it really is. Um, the cure I tell all the kids is you um, sit down and you get your blank piece of scary white paper and you start writing the words to a song, any old, old song, uh. and um, you try and remember the song. And by the time you get to the end, what you really want to write starts to appear. Okay. You, all you've done is break the, the white. Yep. white yep. thing And so you didn't delete, delete, delete. Yeah. Get on with it. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's like if you exercise, I wouldn't know. But um, you yeah, warm up, warm up, <laughs> warm up before playing playing sport. Yeah, that's a warm up. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that 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 makes sense. And do you do a lot of workshops, writing workshops for young people? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of the time, I just talk about me, like we're doing yeah. here. Okay. Um, and um, but every so often, I do writing workshops, and I just give the kids rules for writing things to watch out for, yeah. and um, be be. Aware that ideas like mosquitoes, that they fly in and um, you can smack it or otherwise they fly away again. Yep. You've got to write them down. And yep. later on, when you, you do have writer's block, you get your old notebook out and you flip through and, oh, there was an idea that needs yep. developing and there's another one. There's yep. one. Yep. Yeah, and also because they're in a time when they don't necessarily have notepads and exercise books when, mm. when I was at school, um, is it... How do you encourage them to retain those ideas? I guess, you know, are you training them to, you know, do you encourage them to keep notebooks? Yes, absolutely. Every writer I've ever met um, carry a little notebook with them all the yeah. time. Yeah. And just sometimes one word, two words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just so it jogs your memory for later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think it's important. Um, 
Although no, no, mm. most of the time I can never have it with me, and I've got a file full of napkins and bur- tickets and. Is that is that what this is? <laughs> no, the, the black one, the little black book. The little black one. Black book yeah. of ideas. No, the little black books from Jack's Island. Um, okay. In the World War Two, which I was studying extensively, my yeah. um, my granddad, the other granddad, was an air raid warden, okay. and in Perth, they um, had air raid patrol, and every house had black curtains. Yes. And you had to close your curtains every night and wouldn't let any light out. So if any Japanese bombers flew over, they wouldn't know where Perth was and they'd keep on flying. And so they, a lot of people after work would then put their overalls and the hat on and walk around the streets of Perth making sure there was no light coming mm-hmm. from houses. Mm-hmm. They knock on your door and say, this is, you know, your curtain ajar. Mm-hmm. You go and close it. And if, they, if you did it twice, they find you. If you did it three times, you went to jail. It was really serious because they didn't want you know, yeah, Perth, of course. Perth bombed. And anyhow, my granddad lived in Swanbourne and they had the air raid patrol gang there yep. and they used to pass this on each, each, each other uh, when you did your shift six till midnight uh, and you reported uh, yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Brown at number 64 had her curtains open wow. and then at midnight to dawn and then Mr. Smith at number 24 gave me a great deal of lip, lip and so I'll find him. <laughs> that's, that's what that is. It's, that's fantastic. It's just, it, yeah, and... I found my granddad's house one day. Yeah. It took me a while to work out what it was. Oh, I, well, yeah, I guess it, it, it would. Mm. Um, does anyone have any questions for Norman? That's what year nines do you. <laughs> when will the third book be available? When will the third book be available? Accepted yet. Um, but normally it's about a year uh, leeway. By, by the time it gets edited, then copy edited, and then six people... Get, get to read it for um, errors. Um, I use Grammarly these days. Have you come across that? Um, it's a program to download. It's about $150. And it's like the little underline, but it's on, it's on steroids. And it not only fixes all your spelling and your grammar, but also said you use the word best three times in the last four sentences. You need to change it. This sentence is boring. This sentence is too wordy. Uh, and by like the time a mean editor, this yeah, sentence is mean. boring. So by the time you follow all those rules and regulations, your, your manuscript's pretty clean. <laughs> the best thing I've ever discovered. Yeah, yeah, I right. don't know why I'm telling anyone about it. I should keep it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does it for all your documents um, as well, even your emails. It, uh, what was, uh, sorry, what was, oh yes, yeah. I, I knew there was. Um, it's, so about a year, by the time that happens, then the cover designer's got to read it and they design the cover. And because I've done 13 books now, I get some say in the cover. If uh, in the first couple, you, here's your cover. <laughs> well, fine, <laughs> great. But now I say, I don't like that much. Could you rev it up a bit? Could it be a bit more exciting? And, and, and will Webby be a little bit older? N- um, yes, he is a bit. He's about 14. I think he's about 12 when it starts. He's about 14 now. Yeah. In, um, and he's got a lot more responsibility. The captain of the schooner has registered in his name, so he's now the owner of the schooner. Yeah, but it, so he's the pretend captain. Yeah. He's got the the bosun and the other captain telling him what to do, but they let him pretend he's the captain. So he's got he's a bit big headed at the end of this one. And poor little bugger gets sent back to school. He has to go back to his Christian Brothers College at the end of it. <laughs> and after having you know, all these wild adventures in, in Asia and facing headhunters, they have to go back to sit in the classroom. It's pretty sad for him. <laughs> but I won't leave him there too long. Will there be more? I hope so. Okay. Yeah. So you I, want to keep writing. I like his, it. Very you want much to keep and his story. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and um, and I leave him alive each time so I can do the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> he went there, but all the streets were full of water. <laughs> I love it. Does anyone else want to ask anything else? When Jen and I got together 25 years ago, I, I, I said, how about we have our first anniversary on a canal boat, uh, on a balcony looking over the Grand Canal. Mm. And we haven't actually done it. (laughs) Well, you know, now now you've got to wait, don't you, unfortunately? Yeah, not my fault. No. (laughs) You've got to save on that one. It's Mark McGowan's fault. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, Norman, thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been fun. (laughs) My kids have read your books and, you know, they've always said to me, you know, you should read what I'm reading. I'm mm. I don't want to mm. not your books, but no, in, no, in no, general, kids, because kids books generally. Yeah. But um, I have started to read them, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. So um, 
Thanks, It's Kevin. been interesting to be able to talk to you and hear them. I really want to read Jack's Island. Yeah. Um, and You feel like you're in near nine right with a teacher looking over your shoulder. <laughs> anyway, it's been gorgeous to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming along today. Norman has his books for sale. Um, yes, yeah, so they're if all $15, and I can put them on a credit card if you want, if you want to buy them. Love and organise. I'll sign up for you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming and stay safe and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.